Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Linda, and I'm originally from Michigan, now living in the St. Louis metro area. I'm a college coach with School Match for You and have a daughter at University of Chicago. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy has a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and a master's degree from North Carolina State University. She works in private practice in Raleigh as a mental health therapist. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. Good afternoon, friends. I feel like I've been living out of hotels, timeshares, and Airbnbs lately. Our regular listeners know I had 28 days in Colorado on that trip. Of course, got to spend four days in Chicago and Iowa, and I hit nine states on that trip, visiting a bunch of schools. Bambury Union and a nice little stay in the hospital. I'm just coming back from 10 days in South Carolina, North Carolina, back to South Carolina. That was a little different. College visits at Clemson and Wofford, six days in North Carolina, helping my daughter move. She's moving to go live with her sister in Durham, actually. And I did get to spend time on Davidson's beautiful campus one last time, Um, then back to South Carolina, where I got back to Clemson. And, you know, it's funny. Sometimes you can visit a school multiple times, but you get a lot more out of it by just sitting down with an admission officer and asking some really important and tough questions. And I got a, so much out of Clemson. I felt like I understand Clemson at a whole deeper level, even though I've done a spotlight on Clemson. I've been on the campus probably six times in the last three years. Um, and at some point, I'll be sharing that with you. I think there's some real interesting nuggets that emerged from um, uh, about an hour with an admission officer at Clemson. And it's a fairly popular school these days. So uh, look for that coming up in the not too distant future. So, and then I have one more trip while uh, heading out in two days uh, for Canada for five days for my mom's 85th celebration. But I love to travel. When I was in admissions, my favorite season was travel season. And when I went, um, would be back in the office during reading season or even yield season, there's always an energy there. And I like the variety. And then summer is really more miscellaneous, more projects and vacations and planning and things. Um, But I like the variety of the seasons. That's what made admissions so fun, just like the four seasons. And, you know, we have when it comes to to fall, winter, spring and summer. But my favorite was always travel season. So excited to be to be on the road, but happy to be back here in the ATL for three days. So before we get into today's episode, a listener wrote in and said, Love your podcast. Love the College Spotlights. Why do you not have more Northeastern schools uh, listed under the College Spotlights? I want to address that really briefly. So I was scheduled to go to BEANS, which is an acronym for five Boston schools, for a fly-in for three years in a row. It was canceled on me for COVID all the time. And now I can't go because they restrict independent educational counselors from being on that particular tour. So, friends, I had intentionally planned on doing about seven Northeast College Spotlights because I was going to visit the five schools on the Beans Tour each of the last three years and then stay a little longer and visit some more schools. And so it is true that I had been intentionally not selecting Northeastern school. I mean, we still have maybe 15 spotlights up for the Northeast, but that's why I don't have more. I was holding off knowing I was going to do a whole bunch after that college flying. Uh, and then it just kept getting postponed and postponed and postponed because of COVID. And now I can't go anymore. So that explains that. But just this week, Sylvia reached out to me. She did a 14 person tour in Boston and she was particularly impressed with Wentworth. And so uh, we're going to have her do a spotlight that'll air in 2023 co-op school right in Boston and also Emerson 
And then I've also asked Lisa if she can do one at BU as a school that they looked at closely when Lily was looking at some of the top communication schools in the country. So plus Dartmouth is coming up in not well, in November will air the Lee Coffin Dartmouth spotlight. So there'll be four more Northeastern school spotlights that'll all land definitely in the next six months. Uh, we do strive really to have an equal balance between the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, the Southeast, the Midwest, and the West. It's something we're very conscious of. Uh, but here's an interesting fact. There's actually more Mid-Atlantic schools than Northeast schools because uh, we're counting both Virginia and New York as the Mid-Atlantic. So just know that it's something that we're conscious of. We have listeners all over. We want to make sure we're not neglecting any region of the country. Okay, another interesting thing I want to share that's going to be coming up on the podcast. This is where, as a listening family, we support each other. One of our regular listeners, you know my definition of listening family is you never miss an episode, special status there, heard when we said that Dontrell, a student at Ball State, has a question about AI and how AI is going to affect future jobs. So he's an expert. And so this is, I think, only the second time that I can remember having a parent come on and do a, a special parent interview, but who's an expert in the field of, of AI and data science and all of that analytics and how it works. So that's something that you can look forward to also in 2023. Another thing coming up is the NACAC conference. That's the annual admission conference. Six to 7,000 professionals gather for professional development, meeting of the minds between college counselors, school-based independents, and admission officers all over. Um, a lot of trends, a lot of real new stuff gets broken. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to make it this year because I'll be at my mom's 85th celebration, which is a five-day celebration. I just couldn't do that and four days of conference without neglecting the families I work with. I, I still need to spend some time helping them as well. So, But the good news is Julia and Susan both attended, and uh, I've asked them to pull together their thoughts of some of the highlights from the conference, some of the sessions. And so you can be looking for some feedback on that in the really near future, uh, early October on that. And friends, at the end of last episode, I said this week I was going to be talking about U.S. New News World Rankings, which they massively overhauled. And it's creating quite a brouhaha out there in college admissions land. But I forgot that uh, Julie and I are doing a two-parter uh, where we're looking at students who have all the academic grades and credentials and scores, what's the difference between those who we feel have a great chance at admission at the most competitive schools and those who are still not likely to gain admission? What are the things that those who get in have? And so uh, we're going to continue with part two of that this week. And then next week is when you'll hear the whole U U.S. News and World Ranking debacle. Now, if you're interested, Vanderbilt went ballistic with the change, and uh, Doug Christensen and the Vanderbilt team are doing an overview of why they vehemently are opposed to the changes U.S. News World, World Report made. Of course, they dropped like nine points in the rankings. But if you're interested, uh, on September 29th, uh, they are doing a webinar, and I think it would be good to attend. And so you can just Google that if anybody's having a hard time. Uh, finding it, just email questions at your cosmonkid.com and I can send you some more information, but it should be easy for you to find. Um, so that will be the following week, the first week in October or next Monday, where you'll get to hear that. Today, it'll be a continuation of Julie and I and the discussion we had. And then a whole brand new interview Eric Nubo, the Associate Vice Chancellor at East Carolina State, and he's all over student success. He's somebody who um, Lisa has been very impressed with, and she actually reached out to him and said, I'd like to interview you. Sometimes uh, interviewees approach us and ask if they can come on the podcast. We turn down about 95 to 97 percent of those requests, but we do listen to them. And we've had some great guests that have come on because we listened. And they said, you know what? This actually makes sense. This is one where Lisa sought out Eric. Dr. Newell, and said, um, we'd like to have you on the podcast. I think you have an important voice that our, our students need to hear. 
So you'll be hearing that interview, a brand new three-parter, and that's on the importance of student engagement. Engagement is a key word there. So I think you're going to really enjoy that in today's episode. Friends, before we dive into my second part of my conversation with Julia, a real astute listener may have noticed that when I was talking about institutional priorities, I did not mention alumni or legacy. Was that an oversight? Yes, I should have mentioned alumni and legacy, but I'm not surprised I did it. And here's the reason why. I have been so impressed with how strong some alumni or legacy, even double alumni, double legacy are from especially some of the big, highly selective schools like Penn and Cornell and Harvard, how strong they are that don't get admitted. So while alumni legacy is definitely uh, an extra thumb on the scale at some places, it is an institutional priority at some places, not all, it doesn't carry as much weight as some people think. And a lot of times, grad schools, professional schools, things like that are not counted. Grandparents are not counted. So I should have included it, but I'm kind of not surprised that I didn't think of it right away. All right. Hopefully you enjoy part two of my conversation with Julia. Julia, give, give a, I think some people still might not know what standard strong is. Define it as comprehensively as you can. So sure. You no. Know. Sure. So that would be for, for my school, it would be the most demanding curriculum. Maybe not like I've superseded the curriculum. I skipped seven grades or something like right, that, right. but, you know, took the highest level possible at any given time in five of their disciplines. So foreign language, English, science, social science, um, and math. A little sometimes it depends on what you want to major in, but you can, you know, you don't have to be fully on board for that. Um, but all of that with all A range grades and then probably a 1500, 1550, honestly, usually for, for my student. Also, usually they might be a uh, class president, they might also have shadowed a surgeon, they might actually have done a class at Brown over the summer and the professor wrote for them and they applied. Um, so quite literally stick out in their academic achievement, but also the things they've accomplished. They might be published writers. They might be published researchers. So, but believe it or not, that is, especially when we're talking about how wealthy the applicants are that do apply and go to these schools, that is uh, what seems kind of strange, but that's commonplace in my world to be able to have yeah. those experiences. And so it's actually, it's just very overrepresented in the process, even though it seems really elite and really special and unique and strong. It is. Um, but, but at the end of the day, when we're talking about a thousand spots, you know, uh, then and there's a thousand plus people that look like that. You got to make hard decisions in there. Yeah, and I really encourage people to go back and listen to the podcast Hillary Dickman did, where she talked about um, how she she's an admission officer at Colorado College, and she talked about how she's approaching telling her own daughter about how many spots are actually there. Right. And we started out with a number of openings, and for the first year class, and then. By the time you took out gender and the time you took out international and you took out recruited athlete and you, you took out the fact that um, they're going to want to have kids from as many states as possible, not just all one state. And they're going to want to have some first gen or Pell and some r racial ethnic diversity. The number of kids that are basically in your bucket, the number of spots that are available is really minuscule. And so this is how I think it would be helpful if parents might think about it. Suppose that there was a concert that was happening in your area and um, it was Beyonce and Taylor Swift. The two of them were coming and they were putting a concert on. And, uh, and this was heavily advertised and marketed. Like it, there were TV commercials that were running for like months and months and months and months about it. And what they were saying is that there are 20, 20 tickets that they're giving away for free 
Um, you just have to, you know, put your name in and, you know, there's going to be a random drawing and there's going to be 20 spots. And this is literally advertised, like not just in your state, but all over the whole, your whole region. It was all over TV, everything, radio. I think people would probably have a sense, you know what, I'll put my name in, but do you know how many people are going to be going for that? <laughs> like the chances of me getting selected right. for one of these 20. And that's kind of how it is. Cause there's actually not that huge number of slots. When you think of who's actually going to be in who you're actually competing with, cause you're not competing with somebody from a different gender or a different country. And sometimes for schools that admit by, by college or by major, that limits it down even more, you know? And, and so there's something else that you said that really resonated with me. Being a president of your class is standard strong. Like a lot of times people, or the other thing that's standard strong is being a founder of something. Yeah. And it's something that, that I'm not trying to be negative. It's like Julia said, like, these are the worst conversations to have. And even this, I w there's a million things I'd rather be talking about than this. But I also feel like if we can get people to understand how competitive it is, right. they will be so in such a better place Yes. than what mostly what we see, which is people have no idea at the level of competition. I wish sometimes that there was a way in a confidential way I could let listeners see an admissions file right, and remove a name and then put the names of the schools that students did not get into. Yes. And I, it would be such a wake up call. Like that kid who did those extraordinary things did not get in. Right. And, and so there is an aspect and we've brought this up before that, we know your kid hung the moon, but other people's kids hung the moon too. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and you brought up such a good point, Julia. Like when families come from privilege, they do so many things over the course of 18 years to really get patents. Talked to one of my kids, you know, the other day. He's got a patent now, blah, 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 blah. And I know they think that's the secret sauce. It's not the secret sauce. No, no. Um. And, and, and so this is not attempt to be negative and that the distance travel thing. So that resonated with you. It sounds like to some extent that absolutely high scholar, you know, I remember this kid, I was talking with Susan about this student, Asian, Asian student. Um, and this kid just absolutely cleaned up in the admission process. I mean, it had like the Princeton's and the, and the, and the Harvard's were fighting for this kid. Mm. Well, what did they have? They had done like linguistics at a, a, at a level that you might think a PhD student would have done. Right, right. So there is that kid that's just, this might be the most highly accomplished person I've ever taught. Right. But, but that's not, I'm president of my class, I'm valedictorian, I'm strong in this year's class. Exactly. That's not the same. That, it's that's, not. That's, that's standard strong. Yep. You know, and admission officers can really tell the difference. Like you might think, oh, I've got this one thing that seems really strong to you, but they can really tell if someone's got it or not. And here's another one, Julia. I'm a three sport athlete. Yeah. You're not recruited, but you're not recruited. Yeah. We're not recruited. Yeah. You're Great. Yeah, you're a three sport <laughs> athlete. That's good for you in your high school. Lots of kids are three sport athletes and make varsity in high school. You're not coming to play for us. So that's not really advancing our teams. I know. I know. I love when people are like, oh, I'm going to get a recommendation from my coach. I'm like, why? Why? <laughs> What's the point? You're not going to play that sport at the college. And what does it say about you? <laughs> I find people really overestimate their extracurriculars. Yes. When I'm talking, they say, I was having this conversation with Jeremy this week, but, but my student, I just, you know, I want to be really general. My student has done this activity at such a high level. Mm -hmm. You're not being recruited for it. Other kids have those talents. Yes. So, so I would just listen. If you're, if you're having somebody advising you and they give you some guidance and they say, listen, based on our track record, 
you cannot expect to be in these schools. Just know that's not a conversation we like to have. No. It's not fun for us. No. Yeah, that's not fun. I would much rather tell you that you need to you need to have some of these schools on the list. They're wild cards for everybody, but you're the kind of student that really could be competitive here. You know, I would rather that. And you know, it's interesting. I had, it's so rare that we find people that are in touch with how competitive it is. It's, it's so, isn't it to the point where when we get it, Julia's like, where did that come from? And I had two conversations in the last month. Both are podcast listeners. So they're going to they're gonna know um, I'm talking about them when they hear this. But, and I think our podcast has helped people. A lot of other people have said the podcast has helped, but I still feel like we're not completely getting there as successfully as I would like to. But, one, this is one East Coast, one West Coast. That's all I'll say. And I was so impressed with the fact that they knew that for their own student, and these are both high flyers. Well, those are long shots. Those are like, you know, for everybody. I was so impressed with that. How, they, how do you know this? I don't meet very many people who know this. And they both said the same thing. One said, well, the sibling was just as strong and we saw how he got slammed exactly yes i was just thinking of a family like that yes <laughs> and another one said i'm pretty in touch with the class above us mm. and i saw all the kids all the high flyers there and the di- level of disillusionment in the parents and the students so that's the one thing i find does sort of help people is if they're in touch with other really really strong kids and they get to kind of see their 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 results but um, I don't want to beat this dead horse anymore. <laughs> the purpose is not to discourage. The The purpose is, because here's the thing. One, if you, and, and we're also not saying to not apply to any of these schools either. Like some cases, it does make sense to apply. Right. Some cases, some cases it doesn't, depending on how far you're out of profile. But apply and guard your heart. If, if you're, you know, guard your heart. There's a difference between the person that's applied and they have prepared themselves to know that they're probably not going to get in. Big and difference. The person that feels sucker punched in the gut, how did that happen? So that's, that's one thing. And the other reason why we're doing this is because if you fixate so much on your A plan, right. you're going to miss out on a great B and C plan that you could come to love so much and have an amazing experience you know, I'll share a story from an, um, another podcast listener that really, really encouraged me. And so um, this family is, is taking a shot at a couple of really elite schools. And they have a lot of family tradition and legacy and connections at a lot of them. But they, they seem to know that they're going to be tough to get in. And they said, you want to know what, though? My son visited the University of Pittsburgh and he loves it and we'd be happy to go there. And it just made my day. And I'm like, okay, I need you to find two more schools like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so that's what we're trying to do is help you to identify some schools that are probables, that are likelies that you'd be happy to go to. I don't think it's fair for us to ask it to be your aspirational school. I'm not saying it's your aspirational school. I think it's a little unfair. Even that I challenge people, love your list equally. I, you're, not a, you're not a robot. You're not an automaton. You are a human. You're probably going to like some more than others, and I totally get it. But that's what I don't want people to miss out on is that school. Because once you get out of the bubble where all this stuff feels so important and it feels like such a, a high-stakes game, when you actually get to some of these other schools, I mean, Julia, how many times have we had people go to a school? It wasn't their aspirational school. In some cases, they were even a little sad that they felt like they're settling by where they're going, only to find out, like, this place is amazing. Absolutely. In fact, the maj- I'll have students who literally will book meetings with me before they graduate for a transfer plan, which I think is hilarious because there's literally nothing we can do. And I never hear from that student or family again. And I love it because that means they're happy where they are. Awesome. Great. All right, listeners, hopefully this was helpful. Thank you for listening to us. Just know we're not trying to take a big bucket of water and throw it on that fire that's burning over there. But when you see what we see, 
we see like truly extraordinary kids that don't get in at these places. And we Mm -hmm. see so many people that are shocked when it doesn't happen. Right. We believe that to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And we're just trying to prepare you. Yep. So that you can one, not feel punched in the gut. If you do apply, kind of know that I took a shot, but I kind of knew it was a long shot. And two, find some other schools that are great schools there. You just don't have to walk on water to get into them. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Julia. All right. Thanks, Mark. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Hi, this is Lisa. I'm a co-host on Your College Bound Kid, and I'm excited today to be talking to Dr. Eric Newbel. He is the Associate Vice Chancellor of Student Involvement and Leadership at East Carolina University, and he's going to be talking to us today about student engagement. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. Thank you. I'm so excited to be on. Well, yeah. Um, Could you tell us a little bit of how you ended up being the Associate Vice Chancellor of Student Involvement and Leadership? Like, What was the career path that you took to get to that point? Uh, Sure. I was probably like a lot of college kids, right? Sitting in college, having a great time. I was on the programming board. I was doing homecoming. I I worked in the student center in different jobs and uh, and got to my senior year and people started asking me what I was going to do. And I said, I don't know. (laughs) I was a history major, you know? And so I was like, I guess I'll go to law school. And I didn't really want to be a lawyer, but I was like, I don't know what else history majors do. I don't want to teach. Right. So, um, the uh, what happened is my advisor who was asking me this, who was my advisor for our programming board and student activities, said, why don't you do what I do? And as a first generation college student, I was like, wow, this is so great. I get to stay in college for the rest of my life. This is awesome. Um, I didn't realize it was a job, right? I just thought, you know, this is going to be, I'd be, be in the student center, hanging out, be around all my friends. Um, but that's how I kind of landed into it. Um, to get into the field, you have to at least have a master's degree. Um, so I um, followed in her footsteps. She went to the University of South Carolina. So I went to South Carolina and got my master's degree, um, got my first job, ironically, back at my undergrad, which was Florida Atlantic University, um, FAU, and um, got to work there. And uh, by pure luck, you know, sometimes uh, it's better to be lucky than good. Um, <laughs> I was in a student activities office where the two professionals above me um, both left in the same semester. Um, they took different jobs. And so I got promoted interim to be the director at 24 years old for this wow. student activities office at a school with at that time was about 24,000 students and got the job full time and just kind of worked my way up from there. And then went from there, stayed in student activities and student centers and went to Virginia Tech, um, worked at Virginia Tech for about four years, left Virginia Tech. Um, I'm a native New Yorker, so I wanted to return back to New York at some point. I, I met a met a wonderful woman who became my wife, uh, who was also um, from New York. So she was anxious to get back there. And so uh, we went back to New York City, worked, um, finally got out of student activities, became a dean of students um, at the Merchant Marine College, Maritime College, part of the SUNY system in New York City, um, which was really unique because I was, I was, I was all of a sudden went from these two big 30,000 person universities to 1500 students all lived on campus and in a military style of education. Um, So very different but a, a great learning curve. Um, that also, I became a Dean of Students uh, three months after the Dear Colleague letter came out, which was talking about Title IX and making sure um, the Virginia Tech shootings had just happened when I left Tech. And so the whole world changed as far as college safety, crisis response, uh, mental health on college campuses. And so, um, and that was my first jump into being a Dean of Students. So it was a perfect time to jump nice. in um, because I got to jump in the fire with everybody else and kind of figure it out. And then went on to the Fashion Institute um, FIT in New York City, a um, little bit larger, 10,000 students, became their um, Associate Vice Chancellor Dean of Students, which basically ran all the student affairs functions, athletics, health, mental health, and all the fun stuff, orientation, stuff like that. And then decided that um, I had a child and or my wife had the child i didn't have the child and uh my, clarifying that. yes yes yeah i always i always want to give credit where credit is due um so she um she had our son and um having uh, a son in new york city where both parents are working and me having to work in student affairs and in higher ed which is not a nine to five job more like a nine to ten eleven job sometimes um wasn't really conducive with a commute 
um, on top of that. So we, we decided to look in a warmer climate and ended up in North Carolina. We, we are, um, that was one of my target states, North Carolina, Virginia, because their higher ed systems are so good. Um, and so ended up at East Carolina. I've been here for nine years and uh, really having a fantastic time. And uh, as much as I love going back to New York to visit friends and family, I don't think I want to live back there anymore. <laughs> I kind of, as we say in student affairs, been there, done that, have a t-shirt from it, right? And so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a. I mean, Greenville is a you know kind of fairly active city, but it's not the same as New York City for sure. No, so. not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. You know, you do a lot with kind of getting students to be engaged on your campus. Um, what kind of benefits or impacts do you see for students when they are engaged with the school? Uh, sure. I think um, first and foremost, we, we talk about return on investment, right? You know, that's, a, that's a hot um, conversation piece now, especially around education and higher education. And so um, return on investment, we're talking about post-college. Like, what is the benefit to going to college? Obviously, yes, you get an education, you have a great time, um, but we know there's developmental opportunities in college, growing, learning, um, being exposed to different cultures, people, ideas, points of view. Um, but obviously, there's that the big carrot at the end is a job, a career. We hope more of a, a career than a job because we just I make a firm distinction between career and job. Um, and when you're looking at um, that idea of re return on investment, you want to make sure coming in that you are, are as successful as you possibly can be. And one of the ways that, that you're going to be successful is building right away a support network, right? And that ties into mental health, grades, uh, transitioning, right? And, and also having a good time, right? It, it, hit, it touches all the points for the student, for the parent, Right, and for um, for the our and for our incredible people out of our dean of students office who are dealing with um, crisis response and, and mental health emergencies, we want them to be engaged. So I think when you think about coming into college, the benefit right away is engaging early and often, um, and that means outside the classroom. Classroom engagement is going to happen immediately. Right, you have to register for classes. You have to be in there. Your faculty at every university do a fantastic job engaging in really interesting discussions, topics, sometimes around the subject matter in the class, sometimes broader if it's going, things are going on in the world. Um, I think where it's important, even if you're a commuter student, right, and sometimes we take that for granted for those who are commuting locally, is to not treat it like a high school experience, to not treat it like a quick in, quick out, like I, I, I want something, you're going to give me something, I'm going to leave. Right. You want to make sure you're engaging. You're engaging in obviously the fun activities, the organizations, the clubs, the fraternities, the sororities, the recreational sports, all those kind of activities, um, all the speakers, lectures we have. But you also want to engage. And I think this is a point that is often misunderstood when I talk to uh, parents coming in. You want to get a campus job. And I stress campus job, not job. Right. We see that that studies over the last 20 years in colleges and universities around employment, because, you know, there's always been that debate of should my son or daughter go to college and they not work and just focus on school or should they go and what's the value of working on campus jobs, students have a higher average GPA. They are more successful. They build that support network faster. Think about it. If you're working at Target, Target doesn't care if you have an exam. Right? Not so much. Yeah, these days, Target might pay better, <laughs> but Target doesn't care if you have an exam. Target doesn't care if you want to go home for Thanksgiving break. Right? Target wants you to work and cover your shift. If you're working in the student center, you're going to meet um, our staff. You're going to meet people like myself, where we start to have competitions between our areas about grades. You know, what area has the highest GPA? Almost like you see in athletics. You know, they tout the different teams and what their average GPAs are. We do the same in our work environments. We make sure that we're talking to the students how what's going on. We see mood shifts and we're trained. We all have training um, with our master's degrees and our doctorates in some form of counseling and support. So we recognize when the moods shift and change. And I'll be honest, the, the 21 year old manager of the cashiers at Target doesn't really pay attention to that. They weren't trained that way, right? And so we start asking questions, what's going on? Is everything okay? And we find out, well, I'm having trouble registering for my class. You know what? I know somebody. Let me make a call. Like, so you're building this support network. And I think that's so vital considering that when you go away to college, even if you're local, you've built this support network in your home, in your community, 
right? Maybe in your in your your church, synagogue, right? Those kind of things, or you're building community in your high school. And that high school, most a, a great many of those kids are following you from elementary to middle to high. Right now, all of a sudden, you rip them out and throw them in this new environment, particularly at a school the size of East Carolina of about 30,000 students, where it's a little city. And you throw them in this little city, even if they've grown up in the city here, which is totally new with people from all over the world, not just the country, there is going to be some transitional struggle, right? And the best way to, to move past that is to build that support network quickly. And there's no better way other than just getting engaged on campus, but to also get a campus job. Right. Yeah, it seems like that that would be so beneficial to students. Not only are they getting some money, but they're also working in a supportive environment where people can kind of see what's going on with them and, and care, as you said. Um, in terms of um, return on investment, like, do you know of any like um, studies or anything that show that like students who are more engaged graduate at higher rates or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are, um, and these are studies. You know, when when I when I started looking up the different studies, um, I found that there is no study that proves the opposite at this point. <laughs> um, so it's really any study. If you see that this, this, there's there are there have been engagement theories for over 35 years in higher education that talked about a student who's engaged outside of the classroom in anything from service activities to a group, right, to even a campus job, they they move through the degrees better they have a higher level of resilience right because there's going to be ups and downs there are bumps in the road for all of us right but they have that support network built they average a higher gpa um, and when you look across um, gr a great many greek systems fraternity and sorority systems which i know often get a bad rap they have higher gpas than the average student body right so so you're looking at the more you're engaged the greater your academic success is going to be. But what we find even more important than that for the RI, like me, being a history major, when I got to the end, I didn't know what I wanted to do. If I wasn't engaged, I would have never found this career path. Right. Not just working in it, but actually somebody sitting down and asking the right question in the right moment. And that's what we find so often. I write right around 50 to 60 recommendation letters a year, right around that, you know, March, April, May timeframe. Um, and so often these letters are for students who are going down a career path that's different than what they thought when they were a freshman coming in. And they found that through jobs, connections, talking to faculty outside of classrooms, right? You know, it, I remember when I was in college, and I always say it's not your, it's not your parents' college anymore. College is very different nowadays, right? When I was in college, um, I remember thinking back that, you know, the faculty members, didn't have as many discussions outside the classroom with me as I would like. They weren't advisors. There weren't as many club options, right, with an, with an academic person being advisor. Those convers So I was figuring out my majors just based on how well I did, right? And I loved history, but I had no idea how I was going to use it. And now with those conversations, even something as simple as we have a financial wellness hub, one of the first in the state um, of North Carolina, where students sit down with with professionals who map out where we have software that shows us what where students are working across the country, what their average salary is, what their five-year, 10-year average salary is, what their earning potential is. So we match some of that earning potential with their loans. Interesting. Right? Because so, you have to understand, like, it's okay that you're taking out a lot of loans but, and you want to be maybe a high school teacher where you know the earning potential is not as high. But do you know that? We want to make sure you have those facts. So when you, you get out, you're not shocked by if someone would have told me that I was going to top out at this salary, I wouldn't have taken out this many loans, right? And and I think those conversations, we just had to figure out. I the best example is I remember when I graduated, I would ask a faculty member, what are you going to do? And we have students do this all the time. And this was 30 years ago. Um, I know I look really young. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> But they would they would ask their professors and the professor says, you know, that's for you to figure out. Right. You ask a college professor nowadays, particularly in North Carolina system, which is exceptional, our public system in North Carolina, they will say, oh, well, let's sit down and talk. They, they see it as their mission, part of their job to find students jobs, to find them career paths, where 30 years ago, I think the faculty were like, my job is to teach you in the classroom and your job is to figure out what you want to do with your life. Right. And so it's just a, a different mindset, not bad. Um, not better or worse, right? Just a different mindset of, from what it was before. 
That's great. So um, what does ECU do to promote student engagement? What do you think colleges should do to get students involved? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that we do that a lot of schools do, not every school, but a lot of schools do. Um, you know, I, I get in trouble if I call out schools for good or bad in the state system, so I try not to do that. Um, you'll hear me drop the Chapel Hill bomb every now and again, but otherwise I'm pretty good. <laughs> um, the We do a, um, a freshman year assessment, so an assessment when you're at orientation. So you haven't started a class, you've barely been on our campus, and we're asking you questions about your mental health, what worries you have, what are you excited about? What do you want to engage in? What do you want to get involved in? And then we take that data. And right now we have a 95% return rate, which is fantastic for a survey, right? Um, we appreciate all those parents forcing their children to, to take the survey. And we, we aggregate that data. And there are a number of different algorithms that fit into that that tell us, OK, this person is going to be a little bit more concerning. We probably want the counseling center to reach out and to say, hey, we want you to know more personally that we're here for you, right? Hey, you're, you're really focused on service. So we're going to have our, our leadership and, and service center reach out and say, hey, we're going to invite you to some of our events. So they don't realize they're getting a personal invite. They just think they're getting an email until they start talking to their friends saying, oh, you didn't get that email? I wonder why I got that email. Well, because there was something that we saw. So that's, that's a little bit of what we hear nowadays when we talk about predictive data right, predictive analytics, we're trying to find out before you get here where your, where your struggles might be, where your, where your comfort points are and where you're going to be successful. And then we reach out to you ahead of time to get you to come and invite you there, not just wait for you to figure it out like we talked about before. Um, I think the other piece is every single school has an opening weekend and a first week of events. They call it a million things. Um, we actually just call, call ours opening weekend and everything else is called the pirate, <laughs> the pirate experience. Like, you know, everybody uses that. The, the student experience at Chapel Hill. See, I'll throw it out. Student experience at Chapel Hill. We don't call it the student experience. We call it the pirate experience because it's unique to ECU, just like it's unique to every school. And what we do is we bombard you, and that's the best way to say it, before you have classes. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, with nothing but major events. And these events are as big as 5,000 people coming to them. So we get about 90% of the, the freshman class. And then as we get into the Sunday and Monday, we start to see other students come to those events. And we bombard you, and every one of those have signups for, like one of them is a Raid the Rec, where you're getting involved in campus recreation, and you get there and you figure out what your murals are. How do you work out? Oh, we have a wellness area. We have health coaches. We have we have massage chairs, we have aromatherapy, we have acupuncture, we have, we again, not your mom's college, right? Mm -hmm. Not your parents' college. We have all these things to help you be successful, to manage stress levels, to anxiety, right? Um, and then we, you come to another event at the student center where we take over the whole student center, we call it Pirate Palooza. And we have our student organizations out. We have activities, events. We show all the offices in the building, which there are about five departments in the building, they all come out and they show off what's, a, happening like the financial wellness hub right and they and students are just wandering and seeing it without their parents for the first time and with friends and support and groups that they've started to form right to start to see how to get engaged and then in the first week you'll have other events that happen like our get a clue which is our organization fair where we have about 500 student organizations on campus we'll have about 300 of them show up for this organization fair and they go out onto the main mall our main quad or lawn and we have a firm saying that we, we try to bring the events to you, not you to the event, right? So we're going to come out in the lawn and you have to see us because you have to walk through the center of campus to get to <laughs> almost anything. So you're going to walk by tables of people going, hey, want to be on the rugby club? Want to join, you know, um, Circle K? Want to be in a fraternity? Want to be the, you know, and so we, we are bombarding you with opportunities because much like we hear about with first impressions, right, that first week is the most important time to engage. It's the least amount of academic rigor, right? You're the most nervous, so this hopefully calms your nerves a little bit, but you get to meet people and engage. And you're most open to new ideas at that point because you, you haven't formed an opinion about the community yet, right? So we engage you every way possible. And then throughout the rest of the year, follow up on those engagements and send out different things and communication and you know everything is social media now. Um, students don't want emails. They don't want text messages. They just, they just want social media posts or Instagram posts or Snapchat posts. Um, so even though we're old, we all try to figure out how to get on those platforms <laughs> to, to reach them. But I think 
almost every institution does a great job going out there. And I think um, particularly our pirate experience, we do a fantastic job of reaching out. And then we have a software platform to make it easy. We called it the pirate experience.ecu.edu, right? Where you go on, you can see all the student organizations. You can search them by different categories, keyword searches. You can see all the student events. So you don't have to filter through the the university calendar to see all the academic and registration reminders and you can just go to one place and see student events and activities for you and so that that in, intra website right allows you to log in and see everything that's going on and it has an app you know everything has to have an app these days so it allows you for easy access so we do all those traditional things but i think that um you know i've been at six different schools working i think we do a, an exceptional job of it here at ecu friends this concludes the first part of our three-part interview I hope you'll join us next week for part two of three. Next week in the news, Vince and I will be discussing an article that Vince found and he sent to me. And that article is entitled, Colleges Spend Like There's No Tomorrow. These places are just devouring money. Our interviews with Ron Gruber, and he is the lead money writer for the New York Times, and we're talking about tough questions about money. It's part two of four. Our college spotlight, a brand new spotlight. Linda not too long ago visited Rice University. So Lisa and Linda will be discussing all things Rice University in part one of two. And friends, remember, hard work beats talent when talent refuses to work hard. Did you catch that? Hard work beats talent when talent refuses to work hard. See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.